Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. So October is a really nice month uh, for me and my husband, Tyler, because in a couple of weeks, it will have been five years since we started dating. Um, So in October of 2015, a couple of our friends invited us to Nightfall, uh, which is where old Tucson is turned into an entire haunted town, um, complete with multiple haunted houses, shows ranging from silly and spooky to downright terrifying, and all kinds of infamous scary characters wandering around to jump out at you. And while I talked a really big game, going in. I was basically scarred for life in like the first 15 minutes of being there. And the night ended with me clinging to Tyler's arm in a haunted house and using him as a human shield. And now this was great for Tyler asking me out on our first date after, uh, but awful for me ever wanting to go to nightfall or literally any haunted house ever again in my whole life. And our actual first date was much less terrifying and involved flowers and Indian food and did not include someone dressed as the scary little girl from the ring chasing me. So it was a far more pleasant experience. But as sweet as first dates are, eventually you get to a point where your differences can start to come out. Hopefully not in super negative ways, but if you're being honest and authentic, then eventually your different views and values will start to bump into each other. And for example, Tyler and I discovered that we have very different approaches to scientific inquiry when he broke the bars on my window in the last house that I lived in. You see, I lived in a house that had bars on the windows of all the bedrooms, and there was this little lever inside the house that you could release, uh, that would release the bars in case there was an emergency in the house, like a fire or something, where you needed to then get out the window. And so my landlord showed me how that lever worked, but I didn't know how to put the bars back on because I thought the only reason I would ever be using that lever would be because I was escaping dramatically from my window from a mysterious blaze in my home. So as Tyler was helping me to move into that house, he asked what the lever was for. But without waiting for me to actually answer, he just pulled it, releasing the bars from the window. And naturally, I was not pleased with this as it was dark outside. And as previously mentioned, I did not know how to put the bars back on the window. So I very politely and without any frustration or sarcasm in my tone, asked Tyler why he would just pull a lever that he didn't know the purpose of. And Tyler countered that scientific discovery is accomplished through experimentation, and therefore pulling the lever was a perfectly valid way of figuring out its purpose. But I responded that one should conduct research prior to just trying stuff out in case that experiment has already been done and the answer already exists, and so you don't break people's windows at night. And we continued this argument over our different views on how the scientific method works for about 20 minutes, as Tyler did have to figure out how to put the bars back on the window, which he eventually did. And now there's more important values to dig into with your significant other than just whether or not research comes before experimentation in the scientific method, although it definitely does. Before Tyler and I got engaged, we did several sessions of pre-engagement counseling to sort through our values on a variety of important topics, like our love languages and how we showed care and affection for each other, our family values and patterns, how we wanted to address conflict, how we expected to divide up chores and housework, how we wanted to handle money, and so on. And the only thing I remember we differed on really significantly was how much we thought our first house should cost. And even that was because one, we had no idea how much a house should cost. And two, our points of reference for house prices were very different. Tyler grew up in Aurora in the Denver area, and lots of people want to live in the Denver area. It's very cool. And I grew up in Yuma, Arizona, which is basically on the surface of the sun. So the house prices between these two places are wildly different. But it was still important that we discuss this potential point of conflict before our marriage. And all of the conversations we had in pre-engagement counseling helped us to understand each other better and lay the foundation for a healthy marriage now. And when you marry someone or even just get to know someone better over time, you learn a lot more about their values and your own. And often you will discover values and opinions that you did not know you had until someone else didn't share them. You might think that the way you do something is the obvious way to do it until someone else does it differently. I mean, of course you load the dishwasher this way. Of course you let your pet sleep in the bed with you. Of course you take your shoes off as soon as you come into the door. 
But someone else might think it's just insane that you do any of that in that way. And of course, you should be doing all of those things differently. You see, over the course of our lives, we've internalized a lot of different values from our families, from our experiences, and from our cultures. And some of these are really good and helpful. And some of these may be hurting us and others. And we may not consciously realize how much these values have shaped our thinking and how we interact with the people around us. Or we may have subconsciously merged these values with other ideas, thinking that they are one and the same. And if we've lived in the US for at least most of our lives, American culture has shaped our values through the news, through advertising, and through the social mores around us. If this is the context we have been submerged in, it will have shaped us much like our families of origin have shaped us. And this isn't necessarily bad. Not all of those things are negative, but we need to be aware of it. Because just like we might have learned both positive and negative values from our families, American culture has also given us a mixture of values and ideals that we need to sort through. And a lot of us have collapsed American and Christian ideals into one. And while the prevailing narrative is that the U.S. was founded perfectly upon the ideals of Jesus, it's not hard to look at our history and see that the choices of our country have not always reflected freedom and salvation for all people, like we find in the gospel. This entanglement of the values of Jesus and the values of America has led to a great deal of confusion, hurt, and ultimately people pulling away from the church. As followers of Jesus, we are called to live in a way that reflects the love of God out to the world. And so it's deeply important that we are aware of the values that shape how we interact with the world and the people that we are called, called to care for with the deep sacrificial love of Christ. In our walks with God, we will find the Holy Spirit steadily working within us, helping illuminate the parts of us that pull us away from true life and peace so that we can be transformed into living, holy reflections of Christ's love. And part of that illuminating includes addressing values and views that we hold that don't necessarily reflect Christ to the world. If we are going to wholeheartedly pursue God, then we cannot hold any view or part of ourselves back from the work of the Spirit. And for us to represent Christ in this world, to offer a light and a non-anxious presence in an extremely chaotic time, we must address where the values of America might be pulling us away from the kingdom of God. And this is not to shame us or to make us despise where we live but to recognize that ultimately we are exiles here. Our home is in heaven. And while we are here with a purpose, it is not ultimately where our salvation and hope lies. The values of the cultures around us have shaped how we think, how we act, and ultimately how we relate to others. And if we are committed to learning to see and care for those around us as God does, we need to reflect deeply on these values and choose what will lead to flourishing for all people in God's kingdom. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, it's worth noting that this issue of people intertwining or even exchanging God's values for the values of the nation around them is not a new issue. People throughout the Bible struggled with the same problem and God has spoken into it many times. For example, in Egypt, Babylon, and Rome, we see the people of God submerged in the values of those nations. And often these empires were presented as powerful, but cruel, waiting to prey upon the weak and dominate others through physical might and economic wealth. In Egypt, we see the wealth and power of the pharaohs was propped up by keeping the Israelites enslaved, crushing them with physical labor. But when the Israelites were freed from the oppression of Egypt and led by God into the desert towards a new home, they often called out to go back to Egypt, which they viewed as a prosperous and powerful nation. In Babylon, the people of God were faced with persecution and even death for worshiping a God who is not the king, as we see with Daniel and the lions or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with the furnace. And Rome, in Jesus' time, was the ultimate example of a powerful empire, one that was both militarily and economically mighty and not afraid to crush its enemies. And while the Jewish people in Rome were not happy with being dominated by this empire, they also felt its influence. And they thought the only way to overcome it was to beat it at its own game. 
Their idea of the Messiah was a king who would come as a great military leader, one who could finally bring Rome to its knees. But what was God's vision for God's people? Throughout, throughout the Old Testament law and the prophets, we see a theme of community running through it. Much of the law is about how God's people were to be in relationship with one another, how they would value each other and their resources and how they would care for each other's well-being. The assumption of the law is that you would live in close proximity to your community and would be invested in its good. Each person in the community was valuable and loved by God and therefore should be loved by their neighbor too. In Rome, peace came through victory, both in military might and economic affluence. But in Jesus, peace comes out of love, self-sacrifice and true justice. Unfortunately, our current cultural context can look a lot more like Rome sometimes. The early thinkers who shaped America's foundations glorified the examples of Greece and Rome and their ideas of power and affluence. And we see it not just in our values, but in the very architecture of many of the buildings in Washington, DC that resemble Greek and Roman styles. America prides itself on independence, might, and affluence, modeling itself after empires that sought to dominate those within and outside of it through that same power and consumption. We're told to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, to be independent, to pursue bigger and better and more. And if someone doesn't have those things or pursue those values, then maybe they're just lazy or undeserving. If God's call is towards caring for our community and our neighbors flourishing, American culture often teaches us the opposite. I work hard for myself. I forge my own path. I am strong and independent and I don't need anyone else. But what if we looked at these values through the eyes of Jesus? What new values could God be calling us into as we move more and more into the kingdom of God? D.L. Mayfield frames this idea well. Jesus is the lens through which we must all view our lives in the midst of empire. We cannot escape the political, social, economic, and religious realities around us, nor should we. But an ethic of neighborliness, how we put our love of God into action, should drive us to interrogate the pernicious values of empire that we find ourselves swimming in. Jesus is the lens that we must use as we confront the values of empire we've been given and allow God to shape our hearts after Christ. And in this series, we will use the lens of Jesus's life and teachings to dig into the entrenched American values that have shaped us and how we, need, and how we might need to shift those values to follow Jesus in every area of our lives. In other words, if we're finding values in America that look more like Rome and their focus on power, independence, and economic might, how might we need to shift towards the focus of the kingdom, towards loving God and loving our neighbors while we are still living in the midst of empire? In the next couple of weeks, we're going to dig into some American values that we're a little more familiar with, autonomy, safety, and power. But today, we're going to look at a value that we may not have recognized, as one that shaped a lot of our choices, affluence. Affluence is defined as the state of having an abundance of wealth or material goods, which we generally don't think of as a bad thing. After all, shouldn't we all want to be millionaires with no debt and paid off cars and houses? But the thing about affluence is that it doesn't just lead to financial and material accumulation but to a whole value system that can disconnect us from others to prop up our own individual success. Affluence gives us the ability to choose to have things exactly the way we want them, to consume only what we desire and to not feel limited. And the U.S. is built on consumerism, which is deeply intertwined with affluence. We're trained to want things, not just for their usefulness or because we need those things, but to want the lifestyle or the aesthetic or whatever we think that item will give us because some very well-designed advertising has convinced us that it's possible that we can have that lifestyle we want if we just have that car or that shirt or that new device. And since we're so attuned to wanting things, it makes us also want to build up our own wealth to have those things. More than that, it's become part of our identity and purpose. 
We live to consume, to choose things exactly as we want them and control our circumstances around us. Much like the rich young man in Luke, whose only identity is his wealth, we struggle to let go of our affluence and our desire to control our circumstances, even when Jesus tells us that what we need to do to follow him is to lay those very things down. America values affluence and consumerism deeply, but those same values can hold us back from pursuing Jesus well. In the same country that prides itself on affluence and building wealth, there is also deep inequality and an unjust system that punishes the poor and the marginalized in a variety of ways. The desire to consume has filled our houses with stuff that we don't need while simultaneously keeping many people from accessing basic necessities. Because you can't have cheap clothes and fruit and electronics while also paying people a wage they need to survive. Affluence has done something to our hearts and our souls that can keep us from seeing God and our neighbors. When asked what the most important commandment is, Jesus tells us that is to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. When we have internalized affluence as one of our values, we can struggle to do both of those things. But how can affluence keep us from loving God without all of ourselves? Does God care about our money and our economic systems anyway? And as it turns out, God cares about this quite a bit. Much of the Old Testament is focused on how God's people were not to take advantage of one another financially, how they should treat workers fairly, how the rich should not be valued over the poor. For example, do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not make your hired workers wait until the next day to receive their pay. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vine and do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner living among you. I am the Lord, your God. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but helping the poor honors him. And what sorrow awaits the unjust judges and those who issue unfair laws. They deprive the poor of justice and deny the rights of the needy among my people. They prey on widows and take advantage of orphans. God called the Israelites into a covenant community that would care for the good of one another spiritually, relationally, and materially. There's an assumption here that you would be living in community with others. And so whether you were poor or living in close proximity to the poor, you would be invested in each other's future. You cannot be truly invested in someone's spiritual well-being while economically oppressing them. And to keep the system in place, God also set up the laws of Jubilee in Leviticus 25, a Sabbath year in which property was restored to its original owners and slaves were set free. And these laws are terrible for affluence and wealth accumulation, but necessary to keep the community from becoming disconnected and exploiting one another. But God is well aware of just how hard this is for us, how much we desire to maintain our own sense of control and personal well-being through our wealth over learning to depend fully on God. When the Israelites were led out of Egypt and were struggling to learn how to be in community with one another and with God, they were provided with sustenance in the form of manna, a daily gift of provision. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of it until morning. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. Moses was very angry with them. After this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its need. And as the sun became hot, the flakes they had not picked up melted and disappeared. 
every day the people received exactly what they needed. Not enough to accumulate, not enough to create some sort of secret mana market on the side, but enough. And I'm guessing the people who didn't listen and ended up with that smelly maggoty mana did not make that mistake again. This was a huge mass of nomadic people living in the desert that I can't imagine smelled great on their own. So how bad did that have to smell for it to be specifically remembered in the Bible as being terrible? Pretty bad. And coming from a culture that values affluence and the ability to choose exactly what we want when we want it, this whole situation can sound like a punishment. The same food every day for decades? What if I want something different? What if I want more? What if I want the pumpkin spice version of whatever food I'm currently eating? But this view misses the point of what God was working in the hearts of the Israelites. Before their journey in the desert, the Israelites were living in a culture built on affluence and consumerism. Egypt's desire for power and wealth ground the Israelites down in slavery, forcing them to build massive monuments to glorify the Pharaoh. And while the system was deeply unjust and physically harmful to the Israelites, It also twisted their thinking, making them value this pervasive desire for wealth and prestige. Without correction, it would eventually drive the Israelites to hoard their possessions and exploit each other, just as the Egyptians had done to them. And rather than allowing this to happen, God chose to intercede and help the Israelites reset their internal values here. Wandering in the desert gave the people of God years of practice in what it looked like to live in a community based on trust, justice, and care for their neighbor. Instead of expecting them to go straight from Egypt to a perfect covenant community, God gave them an opportunity to see this kind of life in action, a tangible reset on how to be in right relationship with each other. Mennonite pastor Melissa Flora Bixler illustrates this idea really beautifully. One of my favorite stories from the Talmud comes from a wondering by the rabbis. Why did the manna come once a day instead of once a year? They tell a parable about a king and his son. When the king provided his son sustenance once a year, the son only returned once a year to thank his father. But when the son was given a small daily provision each day, the child returned daily to thank his father. Daily thanksgiving, daily provision, daily a chance to receive love from a God who provides. The story of the manna and God's daily provision in the desert helped teach the Israelites and us how to be content, to have enough, to trust in the goodness and the consistency of a God who provides what we need. Later, we see the Israelites become discontented with this provision, wanting variety and control. And this desire to control all of our circumstances, to have exactly what we want when we want it, is the hallmark of consumerism and affluence that pervades us even now. This kind of affluence, this desire to control has become something, a virtue to be pursued. Of course, you should gratify all of your desires. Of course, you should want more. Of course, you should only rely on yourself and your own wealth and resources. But this can keep us from loving God with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our strength, as Jesus calls us to. Affluence can pull us away from the daily reminder of daily blessing, daily mercies, daily provision from a God who loves us. Reality in which we are in control. And we hate feeling dependent. And we hold up self-sufficiency as the ultimate state of being. But the reality is that we are always, always dependent on God. We cannot control the world around us as much as we might try. We do not ultimately create the circumstances that provide for us. Our limits remind us that we are finite where God is not and where our culture has taught us that we should rebel against that and seek financial and material defenses against our own limits. They really just help us to see reality that God is the creator. God is the one who provides, the one who is in control of the world. We are graciously blessed by God and can rest in that blessing without feeling like we need to strive and hoard our resources to remain secure. 
our ability to be content and ultimately to be generous with what we have comes from a place of recognizing those daily mercies and blessings of God. Affluence often leads to more discontent, more striving, more insecurity, none of which God intended for God's people. And just like God giving the Israelites years of practice in the desert to reset their internal values and learn how to live in community based on caring for one's neighbor, we also need new practices to reset our internal orientation away from the negative aspects of affluence and instead towards thanksgiving. We learn to love God well by remembering the manna, the daily provision and reminders of God's care for us. By practicing thanksgiving, we start to release our need to accumulate and rely on ourselves and instead rest in the grateful acknowledgement of our God who cares for us, who is trustworthy and who is good. And some practices of thanksgiving we can engage in include praying through a gratitude prayer or creating a journal in which we can list the provision of God in our day-to-day lives. We can meditate on psalms of worship that help us to identify and reflect on the aspects of God that help us to draw closer, to celebrate and be thankful for who God is in our lives. But another practice that we may not think of for Thanksgiving is fasting. Fasting calls us to purposefully give up some of our affluence, limiting ourselves from consumption and instant gratification. We create extra space in ourselves while we fast to pray and to be physically reminded of our dependence on God for our needs. I think it's really telling that our culture, even American church culture, rarely brings up fasting or intentionally limiting yourself. It goes against everything in our system that tells us to accumulate and to consume. Consider taking a day long fast, perhaps from sunset one day to sunset the next day and help practice this internal reset from affluence to thanksgiving. And I also recommend the fasting section on practicingtheway.org. And the link to that can also be found in the Bible event if you're interested. And this website has very, very useful teaching and resources on fasting and a variety of other spiritual disciplines that can help us help bring us closer to God. And now that we've looked a little bit about how affluence can hinder us from loving God well, let's look at the second part of the most important commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Affluence can stunt our ability to interact with our neighbors. If you have everything, why rely on another fallible, imperfect human? Why be in community with a bunch of other people that requires that you spend time with them and be there for them? That's a lot of work. Affluence allows us to stay in our own safe little circles, never needing to venture out, but never experiencing true connection either. And maybe we still give, but that giving is disconnected from truly seeing and caring for our neighbors. A system that values affluence can still allow for charity, but it makes that the norm without addressing and wrestling with a system that traps people into never having enough and never being truly seen by the people that could help them. If we can't see our interdependence on others, we will struggle to truly see our neighbor. We don't go through life truly alone, even if we're trying to. Another person makes the coffee we grab from Starbucks, the clothes we are wearing, the furniture and electronics in our houses. In Luke 12, we read about a foolish rich man who has so much abundance that he keeps building bigger and bigger barns for himself, but then is told by God that he will die that very night and lose all of the wealth he's accumulated. Jesus ends the story by telling us a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. And Dr. Martin Luther King had a further interpretation of the story. Not only was the man a fool for focusing on his own affluence over a relationship with God, his building of bigger barns showed that he failed to recognize his dependence on others. And so was relationally and spiritually impoverished in spite of his wealth. Relationship is at the core of God's way of working in the world. 
and affluence can erode that connection. Affluence hurts our ability to be in relationships that involve real vulnerability and dependence on others. It can keep us thinking that we don't need help, that we can live life entirely on our own and that others should do the same. It makes asking for help or acknowledging how we've been helped undesirable. And so it traps us into thinking that those who need our help are somehow deficient. But this is not the kind of life God called us into. God's kingdom is one that assumes that we will see and know our neighbors who are suffering and do something about it. We will not be remembered for how much we could accumulate and how much we could fit into our own barns. Instead, this is what Jesus tells us. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Affluence can keep us from seeing our neighbors, especially the least of these, the broken and marginalized of our world. But Jesus tells us that in caring for our neighbor, we are welcomed into the kingdom. Jesus illustrates this again in Luke with the story of the Good Samaritan. We're told that while traveling along a notoriously dangerous road between Jerusalem and Jericho, a Jewish man is attacked by robbers who take everything from him down to his clothing, beat him and leave him by the side of the road to die. Two men, a priest and a Levite, pass by him without helping. But the person who ends up truly seeing and caring for this man is a Samaritan, someone that the Jewish man in the story and Jesus' audience at the time would have looked down upon, if not outright despised. But only the Samaritan is considered a true neighbor in the story, the one who sees a broken and hurting man on the side of the road and chooses to show him mercy. And this is a pretty classic story for teaching us who our neighbor is, but it also shows us that the people who seem like they should be the best neighbors, like the priest and the Levite in the story, can be pretty terrible at it. And those that seem like they would be bad neighbors are the ones who are showing true mercy and generosity. Our neighborliness is not based on our outward appearance and affluence. It's based on learning to actually see our neighbors the way the Samaritan did. And until we truly see our neighbors, we cannot help them and we cannot address the systems of dangerous roads to Jericho that keep leaving them broken and hurting. We have to consistently ask ourselves, who is my neighbor? And learn to live a life of curiosity about how the world is working for different people and what our responsibility is to each other in that. Dr. King put it this way, all men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects all and directly. I can never be what I ought until you are what you ought to be. Affluence can keep us from seeing these connections, stunting our curiosity about the world. It teaches us to be aloof, disconnected, and independent of needing others and relationships that sustain us. But our God is one who sees the hurting, the exploited, and the oppressed of the world. And we are called to be in that image, those who see and respond to hurt with compassion. Affluence erodes our relationships, keeping us from loving our neighbor as ourselves. So how we do we learn to love our neighbors as ourselves and push back against the ways that affluence can start to erode our relationships? We follow the example of the Samaritan, learning to show true mercy and generosity. 
And that starts with learning to actually see our neighbors. Our giving is important and good, and we should absolutely do that. But we need to learn to give with connection, actually seeing the poor and marginalized around us as full people deserving of dignity and respect. And one important step into that is to move away from the mindset that affluence is equal to morality or virtue. Both as a system and as individuals, we tend to judge or punish the poor and those in need of help because of that need. We unconsciously view those who seem to have it together externally as being internally more good or more moral. And Jesus spoke into this frequently, admonishing the Pharisees and other religious leaders for caring more about external appearance than the internal. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. We have to address what's on the inside of our cups, the internal values that keep us from seeing and loving our neighbor as ourselves. In her book, The Myth of the American Dream, Deal Mayfield tells a story of a relative who worked at a grocery store and was angry about a woman who used food stamps to purchase a bunch of hot dogs and buns, clearly planning to host a party. And this relative judged the woman harshly. What kind of person has a celebration when they are on food stamps? How foolish, how irresponsible of this woman. Clearly, this is the kind of behavior that got her in this situation in the first place. But let's dig into that. This woman, out of her clearly limited means, chose not to hoard and accumulate her resources, but to be generous, to share what little she had with others. And without knowing anything more about her story or her relationships or her motivations, this man in the grocery store judged her harshly, seeing her generosity as a sign of weakness and foolishness. Internally, he punished her for being poor and in need of help, and then for choosing to help others out of her own limited resources. And I have been guilty of this too. I grew up in a context that rewarded affluence. You work hard, you accumulate wealth, and you try to come out on top in the end. I was told over and over again about how people in need had made bad choices and that they didn't deserve the help they were getting. Some of my family worked at a pharmacy and would rail on about how they saw people on Medicaid with nice cars or nice phones, clearly taking advantage of the system. And I internalized these values. And I saw my own relative success as a product of my hard work, my ingenuity, my worthiness, and not at all the product of a system that rewards me for being from a white middle-class family. I didn't learn that I had no idea what the actual lives and stories of these people coming into the pharmacy were like, whether they had had to borrow money from predatory lenders to get cars, whether they had generous relatives who helped them get those phones, whether they were trapped in a system where under a certain amount of money you get assistance, but a very small increase cuts you off from any sort of support without actually being enough to pay your bills. I was not taught to make generous assumptions about where people are coming from, to choose to see people in need as people who deserved dignity and respect, to care about them as I would care about someone from a more fortunate socioeconomic background. And even when I came to faith in high school, I was still trapped in that toxic mindset of God helps those who help themselves. Even though scripture is clear that we are to give water to the thirsty, shelter to the homeless, justice to the widow and the orphan and those who are not in a position to help themselves in an unequal system. And a couple of years ago, when I started my graduate program, we had a seminar where the director of Old Pueblo Community Services came to talk to us about housing insecurity. Um, and OPCS works to provide housing for homeless populations in Tucson, um, including helping find housing for homeless veterans and for people who are recently incarcerated and generally people who are struggling to find safe and affordable housing. And they operate on a model known as housing first. 
And many organizations use a shelter model when it comes to people who are homeless, needing them to first accomplish something and stay in a shelter before they can get into permanent housing, maybe get a job or deal with substance abuse or any number of things. But the housing first model does the opposite. First, you deal with the critical need for consistent shelter, and then you help people deal with their other needs. In other words, you put people in housing first, and then you go from there. And it's not only a very successful model for addressing homelessness, but it also supports the choices and dignity of the person who needs housing, giving them what they need without prescribing to them how they should fix their lives first. But while the director was describing this, I was internally struggling. I thought, but shouldn't people definitely stop using drugs or get a job or do something to show that they can be in a house and make rent consistently? Isn't that better for them? But the OPCS director asked the class, what does someone need to prove that they can be in a house? Turn on lights, fix a leak, mow grass. I realized that I hadn't actually done anything to prove that I should have a home. I barely remember to change the air filter in our house once a month, and I've got about six dying plants in our backyard right now. I have a house because I have always had one, and I have been lucky enough to always have the resources to afford safe and consistent shelter in my life. In class that day, I had to suddenly confront a bias that I didn't know I was carrying, that someone who doesn't have a home perhaps doesn't deserve to have one, and they needed to prove to me, someone who had never experienced homelessness and who was not oppressed by a system that does not care for the poor, that they in fact deserve to have something that I had always had. I had internally made myself a master over people that I didn't even know, choosing to see them as less worthy and less good than me because I had confused my own affluence with my worthiness. Who deserves a safe home? everyone, and not just those that we deem good enough to have one. Financial and material success does not determine our worthiness or how good we are, and we have to confront that bias in order to truly love our neighbors as ourselves. And true generosity also pushes us to reflect on the systems that provide us with wealth while exploiting others. Modern slavery and horrific working conditions are present all over the world, including in our country. And it's those industries that provide us with much of the abundance that now fills our homes. Cheap clothes and produce and electronics and furniture. Consumerism is deeply, deeply personal because it connects us to people all over the country and all over the world with our purchases. But our current system comes with a cost. One of the spiritual fruits of affluence is numbness, teaching us to dehumanize and to detach from our purchases. And we might just think of this as greed, but it's bigger than that. We are in a system that detaches us from the production and consumption of our things. And none of us want to purposely hurt a child in a factory in Malaysia or impoverish a single mother in Guatemala to get cheap clothes or electronics or bananas. But we are just too disconnected from the process to feel the injustice we are engaging in. And personally, I have felt really convicted in this in buying clothes. And I've always prided myself on being really thrifty with buying clothes and waiting for sales and trying to get good deals. And that's not a bad value necessarily. But I'm seeing that the places where I'm getting my clothes from, where I'm getting those good deals, are reducing the price for me by cutting the cost elsewhere. And most likely, that's by not paying people overseas a living wage or neglecting to invest in safe working conditions for them. I have hoarded my own wealth by saving money on clothes, but at the cost of exploiting another human being. And it's a terrible system that's really hard to get out of. But I plan to do my best. I want to stop buying new things unless I am confident that they were made justly. I want to find ways to promote justice in this area. Because if we acknowledge our interconnections with people, we have to learn to see them as people who are just as deserving of justice and mercy as we are. And that might mean changing how we engage with systems that we might have been blind to previously. Because true generosity is costly, not just in our financial resources, but in the time and attention it takes to see others as our neighbors and to care for them.
Jesus gave of his time and abilities to serve others. He fed people and healed them and taught them. But more than anything, he offered them his presence. He truly saw the hurting people around him. He ate with them. He wept with them. And he lived among the people he came to serve and ultimately to sacrifice himself for. And it makes me think about the mobile food bank that we do every month. And since the pandemic started, we've had to shift to pre-boxing the food, which means that we have to go to our partner caring ministries facility each month and put together about a hundred boxes of food where before they were just dropping the pallets off to us. And it's meant that we have to interact with the people there a lot more with the staff of caring ministries and with the volunteers of other churches and organizations who are also running food banks. And I think my internal bias would be to interact with people less if I could just anonymously show up, throw some food in boxes and go home. But I can't do that here. The guys who work at Caring Ministries, like Hannibal and Blake and Nick, they know me now, and I'm getting to know them too. I'm getting to know the volunteers from the other churches that we usually paired with as we're packing boxes together. And that connection is important, and it reminds us that we are in this together as we try to restore dignity and hope to people by making sure that they have enough food to eat. And we can't connect with people as much now when we distribute the food on Saturday because we're trying to physically distance and to keep the people we are serving safe. But we can do our best to recognize the people who show up every month, to show that we remember them and that we care for their well-being. And that's a small thing, but it matters that we are showing up and being there for our neighbors, doing our best to meet their needs and invest in their well-being. Our generosity can go past disconnected giving and lean into community and real relationships with our neighbors. And while we work towards this, we have to remember that we're still submerged in the values of empire. And for all the ways that America can be really wonderful and is a really great place to live, there's still a lot of ways in which it's built upon the same values as the empires of Rome, Babylon, and Egypt that uphold power and excess while keeping many people oppressed. Our citizenship is not based in this empire, but in the kingdom of God. We live in a world with many people who are outsiders, exiles in the empire system. And while we may feel very comfortable in our positions within the empire, we have to remember that as citizens of heaven, we are exiles here too. So how do we live in this reality while helping God's kingdom and its citizens to flourish? Jeremiah gave excellent advice for this in his letter to the exiles in Babylon. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce marry and have children, then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. And this is a good practice, both for those who our culture's affluence hurts and those that it helps. Live in community with one another and work for its good. We help our neighbors by helping them to stay, to build homes, to plant gardens, to raise families, to help our cities embody true peace and prosperity for everyone. When we choose to let go of the ways that affluence is hurting us, and lean into thanksgiving, mercy, and generosity instead. We trade out the temporary wealth and security of this world for the eternal richness of relationship and community in the kingdom of God. Let's seek that together. Please pray with me. Lord, um, I thank you just for your examples in scripture, God. I thank you for how you work in us, how you work to soften our stony hearts, to be open to seeing you, Lord, and seeing the people around us that you've placed around us as our neighbors um, so that we might care for them and be cared for in return, Lord. Help us to lean into thanksgiving, to show our gratitude for you and the ways that you provide for us, Lord that you care for us in all of these big and small ways. 
Help us to show mercy and generosity to our neighbors. Help us to see the ways that we may not have viewed them as people worthy of dignity. Help us to lament that and learn to see the people around us as beautiful, beautiful images of you that you have put around us, God. We love you, Lord, and we are so thankful for the ways you provide for us, the ways that you transform us and help us to be a blessing out into the world around us and to recognize the blessings that you have put there for us to experience as well. We love you, Lord, and your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at damascusroadtucson.com.